All righty. Hello, everybody. We're going to get started in about a minute. Um, so if you have friends in a different room, text them to come over because we have some really, really fantastic panelists for you guys today. Let's see. A um, couple things to note. So we do have um, a Zoom Q&A option. So if you have questions for our panelists, which hopefully you do, um, that's going to be the way to ask them. Um, so we do have a um, different moderator who's going to be watching those questions that you guys are sending in. Um, and we will have our panelists get to as many of them as we can. So start thinking, start plugging those in. Um, <clears throat> that way we can go ahead and Get your questions answered for today. Alrighty. Let's see. Wait half a second till we kind of get people slowing down in here. Okay. Alrighty, we should be good to go. So Again, welcome to our panel. So this is our chemical engineering and material science panel. We have some fantastic panelists for you guys to start getting to know. <clears throat> so we are very excited to learn more about things from them. Um, this panel is gonna be about an hour and it is recorded just so you guys know. So um, no crazy questions, <laughs> but um, we're gonna go till about 5.30 um, and then you guys will actually get a chance to go um, join our mixer and be able to talk to um, some of our panelists and other industry professionals individually. So that will be fantastic. So if you find a panelist in here that you are really excited to talk to, write down their name, head to their mixer afterwards. Um, so, Let's go ahead and get started. So also students, by the way, um, our attendance list will be given to your ASU one instructors. Um, so attendance is being recorded. Um, let's see here. As a reminder, you do have a um, session workbook. So if you're wondering what kinds of questions you can ask, there's some options in there. Um, if you do have a specific um, panelists that you would like to ask questions for, feel free to include that in your Q&A response. Um, and yeah, go ahead and start typing those up. Um, Kylie is our Q&A moderator, and she will be reading through those, making sure that we can get those answered for you tonight. Alrighty, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So for our panelists, um, as I ask questions, I'll try to use your names whenever um, we actually have questions to ask everybody. Um, and then, of course, if for some reason you feel like you're maybe not the most um, perfect person to answer that question, feel free to pass on it. We have some fantastic people here, and I'm sure somebody is going to be eager, eager to pick it up. All right, so um, let's go ahead and introduce our panelists super quickly. Um, so... For all of our panel panelists, if you guys can tell us, you know, just in a minute or so, um, let us know the most important things about you. So talk to us about what you're doing professionally, a little bit about how your education got you to that point, um, and, you know, the roles that you've taken on in your careers. Um, so, Alex, let's go ahead and start with you. Cool. Um, so hi, I'm Alex Weisinger. I am currently a senior material and process engineer at General Atomics. Uh, we, we work on drones, we do a lot of aerospace stuff there. Um, journey started at ASU, graduated in 2016 with a bachelor's in chemical engineering, as well as you know, double majored with a bachelor's in philosophy of all things. Um, got a job working for the Department of Defense as a project and test engineer at the Yuma Proving Grounds in Yuma, Arizona eventually got asked by Northrop Grumman after doing some work with their radars to come work for them on aerospace. They said it'd be fun and I haven't looked back since. Um, and I worked at Northrop for about three and a half years before I recently took this job 
uh, in January, moving down to San Diego to kind of get away from the high desert. Uh, and now I'm working on, you know, autonomous uh, vehicles, which is a you know, very different challenge and it's been a lot of fun. Perfect. Thanks so much, Alex. Alrighty, Francisco, we're going to move on to you. Awesome. Thank you, Courtney. So I am Francisco Bramuñoz. Um, I, again, I'm also a chemical engineer. I did uh, my chemical engineering bachelor's at ASU. I graduated in 2017. Um, and then I took advantage of the four plus one program. Um, I jokingly call it four plus one and a half because I did a year and a half. Um, I graduated from a master's in December 2018. And then I started working with Arcadis in May 2019. Um, Arcadis is a uh, multinational Dutch consulting firm um, that we have different areas where we operate, but mainly we do construction and uh, water resource management and remedial environmental remediation, uh, which is where I am mostly uh, working in. Um, I earned my professional engineer license recently um, in 2022 in the state of Arizona, and I mostly work um, simply put cleaning up messes i clean up uh, oil and uh, solvent releases in groundwater and in soil um, i have most of my sites here in arizona and also a few in utah uh, idaho and california wonderful good stuff to know thanks francisco all righty sienna let's move on to you Hi everyone, my name is Sienna Elias. I graduated as well as everyone else in chemical engineering um, from 2021, so a little more recently. Um, I've had a few internships throughout my career. I was also really involved at ASU, but currently I'm a process engineer at Microchip Technology, where um, I work with a lot of microprocessors, microcontrollers, it's been really fun. So love the semiconductor industry, so. Great, thank you. It's also really fun to have such a recent graduate. All right. Um, last but not least, Sandy, let's hear a little bit more about you. Yeah, so I'm the opposite of a recent graduate. <laughs> um, my name is Sandy Voss. I'm director of research and development at NXP. We, we are in the semiconductor industry, $10 billion in revenue all around the world, making chips for lots of different applications. Um, we are the number one chip provider into the automotive industry. Uh, my bachelor's is in chemistry. My PhD is in material science. Um, Chicago, Minnesota, go Gophers. Um, been in Arizona for four and a half years. I do love it here. Um, I've worked with lots of different engineering functions from around the world and, and really enjoy taking something from concept and early innovation into high volume mass production. Perfect. Thank you so much, all of you. All right. So, um, we do have kind of a starting question for all of our panelists. Um, so as a reminder, students, you do have that q and I know we've got a few questions trickling in, but start thinking about those and getting those typed out. Because um, after this question, we will want to move on to the student questions. So be thinking. Alrighty, so starting with Alex again, this next question is, please tell us one piece of career advice or some sort of career observation that you would like to have all of our students who just started at ASU a couple weeks ago here. I'd probably say one of the biggest uh, things of advice I've gotten even at ASU uh, was being very open to whether it was you didn't get the elective you wanted for a class later on you don't get the project that you necessarily wanted to be, you know, a project lead on when you get into industry. Um, just kind of being open to those experiences and learn, you know, trying to learn through those experiences, as well as kind of taking advantage of it as being maybe you don't know a lot about whatever the subject matter was, um, and kind of, you know, being able to to roll with it and kind of, you know, learn to either appreciate it or kind of take away some of those kind of maybe, uh, you know, kind of soft skills that you can maybe then apply to either a future class or, you know, a future thing in the, uh, in your, you know, industry uh, career. That was kind of something that I think took a little longer than I'd like to admit uh, when I was at ASU, you know, darn, I didn't get that class on, you know, the battery generation class, you know, oh, I really wanted that one, I got with alternative fuels. And I ended up really liking that class a lot. I learned a lot and it, you know, it helped reinforce all the concepts that uh, you know, previously with like mass balances, for instance, you know, didn't really click and it made a lot more sense once it started becoming more real world examples and, you know, oh, that's how this is used. Oh, no wonder this all makes so much more sense. 
Um, so yeah, so just being very open, I would say is, is probably the best advice I could, I would give in terms of one piece. Awesome. Thank you. And I saw some head nods from our other panelists. So it sounds like you are right on the money there. Awesome. So Francisco, what kind of advice would you like to share? One that I didn't realize how valuable it was until later was uh, getting involved on campus and on clubs. Um, I know Fulton has a lot of like uh, student organizations, uh, professional organizations, and I got involved early on at the Society of Hispanic Professional Junior Chapters at ASU, um, and it was really years into my career, I realized how valuable the skills I learned there are applicable to my jobs, because they're skills that uh, you don't necessarily learn in the classroom, because, you know, as students, you're going to do great, you're going to learn your your maths, your sciences, your, you know, your chemical engineering principles. Um, but there's more to that, right? And there's things like speaking to people, speaking to clients, um, how to lead a presentation, how to present your idea in a way that you're going to persuade your supervisor, your, your client, your client representative, whoever that is, right? And I feel like being involved in clubs and stuff like that kind of helped me break out of my shell and be able to do those kinds of things to talk to people and be more, um, sociable in that sense. Um, and I think that um, that's something that is quite valuable, um, no matter what industry you go to. I think that's something that is a very transferable skill. So get involved, go to clubs, uh, professional development clubs, a plus. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, those soft skills are essential. Um, all right, Sienna, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm going to follow what Francisco just said. It's not about the grades you make, but the hands you shake. Now, of course, the hands you shake do depend upon the grades you make. So it's kind of a, a cyclical um, saying. But like he said, uh, you'll hear a lot of people say, always get involved, um, do things outside of your class. And it really is true. You're not going to want to hear it the 90th time someone tells you. But the more things you add to your resume now, especially as freshmen, the more opportunities you're going to have later on down the road when your classes inevitably get harder. So definitely start now. It's never too early to get involved and do things and to, quite frankly, broaden your horizons and become a well-rounded engineer. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, Sandy, what kind of advice do you have for our students? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it has already been said. Um, you know, I, I in, in my own words, I would say try anything and everything that interests you. And remember that even the experiences that might feel like a failure are part of the journey because you're learning maybe what you don't like. Um, and you'll, you'll have those uh, along with that, you know, in terms of the getting involved, remember that you're not on your own. Um, develop your network, your team, your advocates. And that's a part of the learning process is that that community around you is important. Absolutely, yes. Um, and yeah, for all of our students out there, that's absolutely a skill that you can be practicing here in college. So yes, absolutely get in contact with your students and your faculty and everybody else because they'll help you out. Awesome. Well, we are going to move into some of our student questions. Um, so Kylie is going to take over with those. Yeah. Yeah. We got quite a few good ones uh, thrown in. Uh, one of the first ones for all panelists. So whoever kind of wants to take um, the first dibs at it. Uh, what was the biggest challenge in your first professional position? So making that transition from school to your actual careers? What was the biggest challenge for you guys? Um, I guess I'll jump in here. It was totally different. <laughs> it wasn't an assignment, a project, a fixed period of time, and you turn it in and you're done. It was constant and it was a little bit intangible. Um, you know, you, you were given maybe a problem that wasn't completely thought out that you had to work with other people that weren't from your discipline. You might need to go out on the manufacturing floor. You might need to go to the machine shop and talk to somebody that doesn't even have a college degree. Um, so just the sorting through the ambiguity and creating a space that felt organized uh, where I felt like I could contribute was just a it was just a very different world and I'll go back to my career advice and establishing that network that you get out in industry it really is about the collaborating and working as a team rather than independent 
um, which sometimes school can be. Yeah, I'll take you back on there. Uh, you know, with my first job kind of being with the Department of Defense, you know, a lot of veterans, a lot of people who, you know, were overseas, you know, were recently, you know, deployed, coming back, you know, coming back home. And this was kind of like a in-between gig and it paid pretty well for them to, you know, help us out, but not being afraid to ask questions, you know. I had never worked with half of these things in, you know, ever, let alone ASU doesn't really tell you, you know, oh, here's how you make a propellant, you know, for a for an artillery, you know, weapon. I had no idea. I was working with nuclear power generation, you know, the semester prior. So suddenly I'm switching gears massively of, you know, having the back pedal. Um, and yeah, just being able to kind of, you know, not be afraid to kind of just drop the ego. You're not here to impress anyone at this point. You know, you're very much, you're here to learn. So, you know, hey, this guy's been doing it for 20 years or, you know, 10 years or five years. Tell me, you know, ask, ask those curiosity questions. How does this really work? You know, what's something I should be aware of? You know, if there's safety things, what should I be aware of to, to be safe around this? Um, yeah, and there's no definite answer. It's not like, you know, the answer is 42. You'll never, you'll hardly ever get that. I shouldn't say you never will, but you hardly ever get those. It's constant improvement. There's constant revision, you know, you might have solved the problem today. It'll come up in a year and a half or something because of an unforeseen circumstance, COVID or something along those lines. So, um, but yeah, don't be afraid to ask. Doesn't matter if they have a degree or they don't. Ask questions. It's better to be kind of safe than sorry. You're a team. All boats float together. So it's kind of one of those you help each other out when you can. And yeah, even a grouchy old, you know, I'm just right into retirement. They will answer your question. They remember what it's like to be, you know, fresh out of school where, you know, I was used to getting an A or a B. That's what I was used to. And here they are going like, this is a multi-million contract. It doesn't matter if you got an A or a B. You need to, you know, make it so we get this contract. So, um, yeah. Uh, anybody else want to answer that quickly or we can move on to another question? All right. Um, I do have a question for Francisco. Um, a lot of questions about four plus one. Uh, one, what did you get your master's degree in? And then two, um, where was it at? Would you say that the four plus one was worth it? And then is there anything you wish you would have known before going into that plus one um, to be successful? Yes, absolutely. So my um, master's was also in chemical engineering. Um, and if it was worth it, I say yes. Um, because it allowed me to do a little bit more of high level stuff at my at my work. Um, in my company, there's a good mix of, well, in my division, really, of geologists and engineers, um, but they're not that many masters in engineering. So it allowed me to do things more along the lines of like statistical analysis and stuff like that, uh, which are some of the electives that we do in um, in chemical engineering. Um, and that that's where I saw the value of that. And then one thing I knew um, that I wish I knew before getting into the four plus one um, is basically knowing that there is not one path of building that degree. Um, I feel like undergraduate and graduate degrees are quite different in the sense that um, a, a undergrad is, is more structured in the plan and the way you build it and kind of like electives are towards the end. Whereas masters, you pretty much have electives on the get go. Right, right away, there are some core classes, but there's some classes that you get to pick and choose. And kind of going back to what Alex was saying, you wanna you wanna keep an open mind, right? And see whatever interests you, like Sandy was saying, uh, try it and see if you like it. And if you don't like it, then hey, there's a really cool skill that you can use later on, right? So um, I wish I knew a little bit more, um, get myself more acquainted with the electives that there are out there. Um, I probably wouldn't change any of any anything I took, but at least I would have known a little bit earlier. I was like, okay, this is a professor teaching that. Maybe I want to talk to them a little bit and see what the research is like or stuff like that. But yeah, that's about it. Excellent. Um, great advice. Uh, so moving on to another question. This one is for Sandy and Sienna. How has being a woman in a very male dominated field um, affected you guys? both professionally and personally? Um, and then what's kind of been the biggest challenge for you guys to overcome? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, yeah, I definitely think women, um, there is, a, I think, a better gauge. I've been at NXP as well as microchip. So I've been at two different semiconductor places, I an internship at NXP. And I definitely think there is more of a um, better transition to having more women just in general in leadership and leadership in all different positions. So I definitely think those things have turned. But I think as a woman, um, I don't have any, obviously any problems really with people that I work with or anything, but I think as a woman, you just can't, semiconductors, when you first get into it, is a very like complex ideology. There's a lot going on, a lot of acronyms, a lot of things you don't know. So I think just being confident in yourself and not doubting yourself, I think that's something that women tend to do is have a lot of like self-doubt um, that maybe men don't inherently have. So I think just being confident and knowing that maybe you're around by a lot of people that are way smarter than you that have been in there a lot, lot longer that doesn't mean you're not qualified and that doesn't mean you're not deserving um, and just taking it, you know, one day at a time and learning more and more and don't doubt yourself. Yeah. See, and I think that's, that's great advice. Um, it's getting better. I've been out in the workforce for over 20 years um, and the stories are getting better. Things are a lot more equal than they were when I started. Um, I think the engineers are really great to work with. Engineers are logical. Um, and so if you're there to do the work and, and share the load, they're, they're happy to have you. Um, I think sometimes women can self-doubt themselves, like Sienna said. And so usually the advice that I give to the female engineers is uh, just be a man, have confidence in yourself. Um, it can be tough. So like anything, back to my career advice in terms of having your people, have your people so that, and, and my people, they're men, women, people from all over the world in different cultures that I go to when something doesn't feel right, I talk it out with someone I trust. And I think that's important regardless of your background or gender or whatever. Excellent. Uh, so moving on to another question. How did you, this is for all of you guys, you guys can all answer this. How did you guys find your first internship or job? Like, what were the key steps that you guys took to secure that? Um, if you guys can kind of talk a little bit about the process that you guys went through um, in those searches. Um, I guess since I'm like the newest one, so to speak, I guess I'll go first. So um, I worked for the Engineering Career Center. Um, so they gave me a lot of opportunities to find new things. I had two internships. Um, I probably could have found one earlier, um, but I didn't um, I didn't look. I didn't know as much as a freshman that you could get ones as earlier. So I wish I would have tried harder. But uh, I won my sophomore year and won my junior year. My sophomore year, I applied to so many off of Google, just kind of blind applying. I was involved in Epics and I was involved in a few other leadership um, opportunities at ASU. So make sure you are building your resume early. There's, it's never too early to start. Um, so I got my first one straight off of Google, um, just applying and applying. And then my one, my junior year, I worked at NXP. Um, it was a great internship, and I actually got it through the rapid resume reviews that the Career Center used to hold. I don't know if they still do. Um, but again, I was literally just going there to work and um, to hang out with all the other people. And one of the guys from NXP he pulled me over, and he, I was like, can you look at my resume? And he was like, yeah, I think you should work here. So you never know what could happen. Um, and then took, from there, I was able to um, get another job with microchip once I graduated. So you can never know what opportunities you might get yourself into when you go to new things. Anybody else want to piggyback off of that or you think she summed it up? Excellent. Good. Awesome. The only thing so, I'll add to that, and, and it's it wasn't around when I found my internship, but there's this handshake platform and there's lots of stuff happening on there. I know NXP has a ton of internships posted on there. So check it out, reach out to people, um, lots to find. Awesome. Uh, so again, kind of for all you guys, um, maybe more so Sandy and Alex, since it seems like you guys have maybe been graduated a bit longer um, than the other two, but how do you guys stay current with new skills required for your professions? I would say uh, the easiest way is by talking to the newest, you know, the newest employees, you know, I, you know, onboarding is a great way to, to kind of quickly, uh, you know, interact and kind of get a background idea of kind of, you know, what, 
if anything new has happened in, um, in terms of academics, but it's also, you know, a good way to kind of gauge just kind of what's being taught and, and kind of what's expected for our new hires. Um, the other way is usually with conferences, um, you know, our, at least in, in our industry in aerospace, you know, it can be a little slow moving compared to semiconductors and a few others um, that have, I would say, you know, probably a little bit faster pace uh, innovation than we do. Um, but, but it's one of those things where, you know, there's a lot of conferences and kind of ways for uh, that kind of knowledge exchange amongst different professionals within the industry, as well as then conferences where different universities you know, from ASU to, to various other universities will kind of have their PhD programs pitching, you know, usually projects pitched by the government, at least in my case, it's usually government or DARPA or something along those lines. Um, you know, technologies and us trying to figure out ways to use them with the products that we're trying to, to, to create or innovate with. But that's usually the, the, the best way is through, uh, yeah, kind of staying in touch with the uh, kind of the PhD community and going to a bunch of those kind of industry specific conferences. Yeah, just a couple of small things to add to that. I, I mean, decide what you want to learn and, and find it. Uh, go out there and find a, a class, a book, a webinar, a blog. There's so much out there online. It's fantastic. And then the, the classical way, you know, talk with the people you work with and your manager and, and lay out some training courses. You know, most managers are very open. If there's something that applies to your job, they'll, they'll send you to a couple of day training class without a problem. Excellent. Great advice there. Uh, next question for everyone. Uh, what does the general everyday daily life look like for you guys at work? Um, whether that's working in a lab, sitting at a desk, kind of what does your day to day uh, look like? I'll go first and I'll just say that uh, with my first job, it varied very differently from my later jobs. Uh, when I was doing my project engineering and test engineering in Yuma, uh, I would say 80% of the time I was probably behind a desk uh, doing lots of test planning and, and kind of getting clearances with the FAA and stuff for, you know, doing practice uh, radar shoots and stuff like that. Um, and then the other, you know, the other amount I was out usually blowing stuff up um, because it's, you know, our, it was artillery stuff at the time. Uh, and that was, you know, the other half of the job. And I would say now that I'm in the aerospace with material, uh, you know, material engineering, material process engineering, uh, it's more of a kind of a mixed bag where one day I'll be, you know, in the lab doing a material qualification with composite panels and different, uh, you know, and different maybe top coats on top of them. So another day I'll be on the manufacturing floor, answering questions and showing technicians, you know, why we don't use certain materials together due to corrosion issues. Um, and then another day I'll be giving a presentation to, you know, to, to management or to a business sector, trying to justify why certain technological, uh, you know, tech decisions need to go a certain way, um, you know, regardless of kind of the cost, which is always something that as an engineer, you have to always be mindful of. Um, and then finally, you know, doing report writing, everyone's favorite job as an engineer, doing lots of report writing and, and sitting in meetings, right? Um, that'd probably be the other bit, but it, it, there's no real way to say that, you know, I know that tomorrow I'll be doing this. It's kind of, you know, it's variance and that's what I enjoy about it, but I know that's not every, uh, you know, everyone's cup of tea. Anybody else want to piggyback off of that? Like Francisco, would you like to? Yes, absolutely. So mine is uh, not like that. Uh, there's some parts of it like the report writing and the meetings and like the office work that is you know very similar I feel like across many industries um, but in my case I do a lot of field work um, and in a given week can be anywhere from 100% to 50% to you know depends um, and field work is being out there and collecting samples being out there with field techs um, you know getting samples or getting you know supervising a crew um, doing some construction or whatever it is. Um, I, not that much anymore, but I used to travel a lot for work, um, particularly to Utah to oversee or to conduct or lead uh, sampling events. Um, and sometimes it could be something like in the middle of the city that we're doing some quick routine work to, I don't know, we're constructing this one 
um, remediation system. Uh, we need to check over the crews and make sure that everything is being doing is being is being done to uh, to specification. Um, and then there's times where you know I am literally in the middle of nowhere. The town has a single streetlight, and I am out there collecting samples and you know uh, by myself and. You know, things sometimes go wrong and you plan, you know, you expect the best, you plan for everything, but, you know, you also got to be ready for the worst, right? And, um, you know, if it's whatever, 40 mile per hour wind gusts in rural Utah, you got to, you know, but, you know, uh, get things resolved there and then. And it's a lot of troubleshooting and a lot of, you know, systems that are going down and getting them back up and running. Um, which is the part that I really love about my, about my job. Um, problem solving on the spot there and then putting out the fire figuratively, sometimes literally not for me, but you know, it's, it's a cool part. So that's kind of like what I do. Excellent. Anybody else want to piggyback off of that? Okay, we'll move on to kind of the next question. Um, be kind of trying to summarize a couple of different questions. Um, for students who, well, I guess material science and chemical engineering can be kind of broad in terms of what you can do. What are some strategies and advice that you give to those students to kind of help narrow down uh, their focus on terms of like what they specifically want to go in towards as their career? Um, any advice on that? I'll say try everything. You know, if it's like, a, think of it like it's a restaurant, right? Everything on the menu looks good. Try it all to figure out what you like and what you don't like. Um, if you don't like it, there's always something else there. You know, it's kind of the, the joy and kind of a perk of chemical engineering and material sciences. They are very broad fields. Companies will want you to narrow them down, but they, they understand that when you graduate, you're gonna have a very kind of generalistic view of how different materials and, and how chemical engineering works. And they're going to be there to kind of help focus you down. And then that's where you can determine if you kind of like it or not. Um, and it's okay if you don't. There is, it's a very large swath. Um, you know, not everyone is interested in tapes and adhesives right away. It takes a little bit of time, a little bit of getting used to. Um, but yeah, but you won't know unless you try it first. You know, you won't just be able to read from a Wikipedia of, oh, I, this sounds interesting. Like you need to kind of do it a little bit because everything sounds great on Wikipedia. Uh, but in practice, it's a different story. So try everything. Don't be afraid to try something that you might not know much about, or it might be, you know, not interesting sounding. You might surprise yourself. Uh, that, that's a great analogy, Alex, the restaurant and the menu. You, you know, I know for me, sometimes I'll, I'll go to a restaurant and look for something that I think I will like. What I'll add to that is try things that you think might push you out of your comfort zone. Um, and so I would add on, maybe don't focus too soon, right? That's what um, classes, internships, research projects are for. Spread it out, be broad early so that you can kind of see what naturally interests you. Um, and you know, kind of back to that question of what is a day in the life like? Always ask lots of questions, including that question, because somebody in chemical engineering and material science might sit at a desk all day, might go in the field, um, might travel the world and talk to customers. There's a wide range. So just keep asking those questions to get as much information as possible to help you with that focus. Any other two wanna speak on any of that or? No, I can assure you when I was a freshman, I didn't know what a semiconductor was. So there's probably things that you don't even know exist right now that you might be working or that literally might not exist right now that you might be working in in four years. So just be open. Um, you never know what can come your way if you aren't so closed off. I can assure you what I thought I wanted to do four years ago isn't anything that I'm doing right now. And that's totally fine. I, you'll, you'll learn to enjoy it or you'll find something you do enjoy. Excellent. So then moving on to another question, we kind of already talked about four plus one and the benefits of that. Um, one question is, do you guys recommend graduate professional school um, immediately after graduation? Or is it something you think 
go out and get experience and then go back and pursue that. I guess I'll have the controversial opinion of saying you should wait, um, wait a little bit, not, you don't have to wait forever, but just, you know, get your feet wet a little bit beforehand. Um, I knew when I graduated in 2016, uh, you know, chemical engineers as a whole had a little bit of a harder time getting a job, specifically at least my classmates did, um, some of whom, you know, were, you know, straight A 4.0 plus students from the Barrett Honor College. Um, and some of them jumped into a master's just to avoid the job market. And I get that it's a very natural thing to do, but I would say that as, you know, now as someone who is finishing up their master's this year, um, it made it so I was able to find a program that was in the kind of the, the knowledge area I wanted to, you know, deepen my knowledge in and kind of could hone myself to being able to follow that track of eventually wanting to become a SME or a subject matter expert, um, you know, in my field. And that's something I think paid off dividends. You know, the company uh, that I worked for, you know, wanted to pay to, you know, oh, we'll pay to you know, send you there. We'd be happy to, you know, have you do it on our dime. And that's something that, you know, and I get that's something that's an 18, you know, you're, you're young, you're not really maybe thinking that far ahead. Um, but that is something that can be a perk then at some of these companies later on is that they want you to kind of further the education and bring that knowledge that you are going to learn into a company that might not have it already to teach them and to help, you know, improve their practices, um, as well as, you know, for you, hopefully, uh, you get to kind of then be seen as like the person responsible for, you know, maybe it's a, a new material or a new process. Uh, so you kind of get to know the ins and outs, you can kind of make it your baby, so to speak. Um, so you have that little bit of kind of putting putting your kind of blood, sweat and tears into something having others who don't understand it, maybe criticize it and kind of teaching you at the same time of how to kind of then improve it and become even better of an engineer. Um, that would be my two cents on it. And avoid an MBA until after you have been in industry because yeah, I know MBAs are always very appealing and everyone loves to talk about getting an MBA to be a manager, but you need to lead a project first before you have an MBA so you understand why you need the MBA. Um, I'll get off my soapbox. I'm sorry, I'm very passionate on this. I hear this often. Any other differing opinions? So I'm starting an MBA next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, yeah, so I definitely agree with, you know, different financial reasons companies will um, pay for your school. I just finished um, a Lean Six Sigma black belt certificate. So I went back to school for that. Um, the only reason why I did that was because we use jump a lot in semiconductor world. And a lot of the things I learned kind of in college, you know, statistical analysis, but I wanted to kind of go deeper into it. Another thing you'll hear a lot of process engineering or PFMEAs and, and all sorts of different things. And I wanted to know more about those. So I kind of found a program myself and just took it and the company to pay for it. Um, but yeah, I am interested in MBA as well. Uh, I do, I do some project uh, management as well. Um, not like official title or anything, but I do do a lot of things at microchip. So having those different experiences, I think are good. And hopefully the MBA will help as well. So kind of allowing yourself to get involved with more things once you learn more. Yeah, maybe just to, to add a couple of cents. This isn't a mathematical question, so there's no one right answer. Some people it works to go straight through. Um, some people it doesn't. I worked for five years in between my bachelor's and PhD and maybe waited too long because I forgot calculus, but it worked out. Um, so figure out what works for you. Some people go for an MBA and some people never go for an MBA. There is no one right answer. Excellent. Um, moving on, there's a lot of good questions going on. Uh, next one is how frequently do you guys engage customers? if at all? Uh, weekly, if not, sometimes every other day. It depends on the project, though. Um, you know, it, it can vary where if their customer is very interested in progress and understanding, uh, you know, if you have to help with the repair process or something, um, you'll be in contact with them every single day. They'll be calling you, you know, even when it's super late, you'll be wanting to kind of, you know, be at home, you're cooking dinner, and suddenly customers calling and it's urgent. Uh, you know, there's a lot of money on this, so it's kind of your responsibility to kind of help with that. Um, you know, and then there's other times where a customer is very much just, I just want to see the end product. Don't care how you get there. Just get there. And you're just, okay. Um, so you kind of get both 
but I'd probably say weekly and with my experience is usually how often I interact with the customer. Um, with some exceptions, it's either more or less. Yeah, I would say weekly for me for some projects and then some projects is I have never met the client. Um, I've also not necessarily customers, but um, also because the work we do has a lot of third party uh, owners and property owners and tenants and stuff like that, because sometimes we literally have to dig a hole in their property or sometimes we have to, you know, dig, drill a hole through their slab and collect something. So we have to approach people and something that another thing kind of a tangent, but a skill that came really useful for me was speaking Spanish because more times than not, I am the only person that can talk to the managers and the engineering side of things, but I also need to kind of translate that and sometimes literally translate that to a different language, uh, to a property owner or to a tenant or whatever that is. So um, there's definitely variance in the type of people and the expertise and the, you know, different types, I guess, of people that I interact with. So. Great. And actually kind of picking, picking back off in that um, about the, the Spanish uh, for the rest of you guys, were there any skills that you guys didn't like realize that were going to be crucial to your job that, you know, are and that you guys have developed by working in these positions? For me, on top of Spanish, I would say uh, being in SHIP and other student orgs, there was a lot of event planning that we did. Um, and then now a lot of what I do in my projects is specifically that sampling event and then construction event planning. Um, and that came in really handy more than I would like to admit because that was that kind of allowed me to know how to budget works, how to create a plan, how to get, you know, your timetable, see what the critical path is, what is what takes the longest what you can be doing in the meantime and stuff like that. So um, I would say that the planning of events in a very broad sense um, is a skill that was very, very useful. I'll in, add in uh, that, you know, every group project that you'll do in your, you know, in, in school, even ones from when you were in high school, uh, knowing how to resolve conflict, knowing how to, you know, kind of help with team cohesion. Uh, I remember at ASU, I had some team projects that, you know, you look at and you look back at, and I remember being very flustered, very, you know, oh my goodness, I'm doing all this extra work to get the team across the finish line. You know, I don't want them to get credit. You know, everyone has those feelings or, you know, this person doesn't do anything or, you know, these people don't get along. Um, Learn while in school how to handle those because it makes you a uh, MVP as soon as you run into in the real world with you know adults um, who sometimes don't get along or they're having communication issues where they're just you know they they don't want to drop a point. Um, being able to resolve those conflicts will make you the the level head in the room and everyone notices that very quickly. Um, and that's a soft skill that I would say goes greatly unnoticed. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pull out a word you said there that I think is a common theme from what Francisco and uh, Alex said is communication. Um, whether it's communicating to your management, communicating to your team that you're working with, um, communicating with a person that maybe has a very different approach than you and you might be dealing with a conflict situation. Um, everyone that you come across is another human being trying to do their best. And so by, by honing those communication skills to, to work through that with all the other people you're working with is super important every day. Excellent. Uh, next question. I know we talked a little bit about uh, technical writing, not maybe not being the most fun part of your guys' job, but is there any other aspect that you guys just find as a, you least like about your, your current careers? I'll say at least with my, uh, with my field working with, uh, you know, with sensitive information um, from, for a government level, 
Uh, it sometimes is a little bit of a bummer when you see, you know, on LinkedIn or you connect with friends and they can talk about all the cool things that they do and that they work on. And I just have to kind of sit there quietly and go, I work on planes um, and just kind of leave it at bare bones when deep down I want to be able to, you know, point to things that you see like in a movie or, you know, things that are in video games and be able to pretty much like kind of hint of like, I know how that works or that's not how that really works. I know what the real capabilities of are and it would blow your mind or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, in my field, you can't really be too boasty. You can't put too much on your resume. A lot of it has to be that kind of not necessarily redacted, but you kind of just, you know, kind of, you know, walk around the issue at hand, um, being very broad in general. And at least in my industry, people get that. Um, but obviously for the general populace, you know, there is that kind of like, well, why can't you tell me more? And it's not easy. So I'd say that sometimes is a bummer, especially around, you know, the holidays with Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, and the winter break coming up in a couple of months. That's when everyone likes to ask, even your family, and you have to kind of just look at them and say, like, let's not talk about work. Let's talk about, you know, baseball or football or something else. And it works like a charm every time. Um, but that would probably be the only thing other than writing all the reports that I would say is, is, is a bummer about the job. But it's not the worst bummer. Anybody else where everybody just loves their job, every aspect of it? None of the rest of you guys have any comments? I think the only thing that gets a little tiring for me is, well, one, getting through airports. Um, I'm seriously considering, you know, of whatever the fast pass is. Um, but sometimes in the field, you know, it's field work and it's 120 degrees sometimes in Phoenix. Of course, we try to schedule around those and try not to be out there. But sometimes things fail at 120 degree heat and you got to be the ones out there. Um, sometimes, you know, Blizzard rolls through Flagstaff twice in the week and you got to plan around that or, you know, stuff like that. That's weather, weather related, I feel like. Um, ironically, in Arizona, even though most of the weather is generally okay, um, you know, it's things like that. But at the end, it's also, I try to see it as a teaching moment or a lesson um because sometimes it's like oh i've i mean i grew up in mexico and we never really see snow where i'm from so now that i've been traveling a lot to utah is oh i have to think about snow melt i have to think about you know thermal stresses on my pipes and stuff like that that's something that i'm not used to but now i'm you know it's a it's a lesson that i can learn from so i try to see the positive out of that <laughs> Excellent. And then uh, moving on to another question, um, Sienna, this one was directed towards you, probably because you're a recent grad. Um, what strategies did you use to be successful in your classes? Yeah, I, I was a very big and still to this day, even if I have a work project, I try to be a really head of schedule because you never know what could come up. So I was always the person that was like studying a week before tests and people made fun of me and they're like, I don't know why I was doing the night before. I think not being a procrastinator, I'm like the opposite of whatever a non-procrastinator is. Not being a procrastinator um, is huge. So you have enough time to learn the material that's harder. You might, you might feel like your first year and a half or so that you kind of already learned it from high school, but those bad habits will catch up to you. Um, you won't be able to do thermodynamics, you know, the night of. So that won't work. Um, but just being, I guess, just learning the material as it's taught, um, go to class, you're paying for it at the end of the day, go to class, um, learn the material. Um, and really, I think actually something I wish I would have almost done a little better is like really learn the material well, not that I didn't learn the material well, but some things, you know, the longer you learn it, the more it sticks with you. And I feel like I've kind of, it's like you leave the class and you forget everything the next day kind of thing. I wish I would have took more time to really learn the material even better looking back on it. So just, just doing your best. Awesome. Great advice. Um, moving on to another question for all of you guys, kind of uh, putting together a few different student questions on this. And in terms of uh, material science and chemical engineering, uh, what does the future look like for those um, specific paths? Like, is it a stable uh, future? Um, are they going to have careers when they graduate? You guys want to speak a little bit about that? Heck yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think when people think of chemical engineering, material science, they think of gas and oil. Um, with all due respect to the gas and oil people, 
there are so many other opportunities. Um, semiconductor, for one. Um, I mean, even airplanes, they used to be made of metal. And uh, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner was like, what, 80% composite materials, right? So that just, I mean, boom, lots of jobs in Kemi Matt side to enable that transformation in technology. That's just one example that there's tons around the world. You know, I, I don't fully understand what Francisco does, uh, but I watched this video that's very pertinent to the sensors that, that we make. Um, in some of the NXP business, it was um, autonomous vineyard. You can YouTube autonomous vineyard. And it looks at farming, one of the oldest industries, and how we make farming high tech um, for multiple reasons. From a business perspective, for the farmer, it's, it's a better business for them. They save more money. But then also for the environment, just looking at the water and saving more water. So boom, chemical engineering, material science all over the place. I think it's an exciting place to be. But maybe I'm biased. And I agree. I think that whether you're a chemi or a material science and engineering, um, the future is bright. You know, don't get too discouraged thinking of all the people that are going computer science, electrical engineering. I remember that was the big hot major when I graduated. Everyone was that. They were, you know, Intel and, you know, all those semiconductor companies were hiring them in mass and the chemis and the math science. Well, they're, you know, they do get hired, um, but it was, you know, there's a little less jobs for them, at least, you know, at the time than there was for, you know, a bunch of people who can code and a bunch of people who understood how the software architecture works um, compared to, you know, kind of the manufacturing and kind of the understanding of different materials and how they interact um, for semiconductors. Um, and then, yeah, just don't think that it's only oil and gas. I know that's the most, most of your textbook examples will be oil and gas examples for the most part. Those examples have not changed. I guarantee you'll run into hexane and things that we do not use in industry anymore. Um, but it will be on there because it's a great, you know, it's a great academic teacher. Um, but yeah, but I would say the future is very bright. It's just a matter of you just need to be willing to look outside of maybe the more traditional path of oil and gas and look into, you know, the kind of pharmaceuticals, aerospace, semiconductors that, you know, you have a very versatile deg uh, degree. You can, you know, I, I feel bad saying this, but you know, you can do what a mechanical engineer does. They just take a few different classes than you. So it's just a matter of, are you willing to learn on the job? Are you willing to, to stay curious and ask the right kind of questions? You know, that's something that a company can pick up on. And, you know, they're, you know, the, the world is your oyster um, with, a, with a chemical engineering or a material science degree. I like to add that a little bit that kind of, uh, what Sandy and Alex were saying, like, yes, there's, uh, there's like the kind of traditional paths, but there's also like more to that, uh, where I, where I'm at, which is in the environmental consulting industry. Um, it's, I mean, pollution is there. And right now the biggest talk in environmental is PFAS and all these emerging contaminants and contaminants that we didn't know there were contaminants five, 10, 15 years ago. And now we need to find, figure out a way to clean them up. And that's where chemical engineering comes in. We need, you know, to design these processes that nobody has ever thought of before. Some of these processes, people are thinking, well, if it's humans the issue, then how can we have microbes do the remediation instead? That's where chemical engineering and that's where material science also comes in because you have to look for alternatives that you're not gonna make the problem even worse, right? And kind of like the tongue in cheek that we have in environmental engineering is just like, it's, it's a stable career because pollution is always going to be there and you know it's matter of time when something leaks and not to be a downer but that kind of does happen uh you know things sometimes go wrong and sometimes you gotta clean stuff up and that's where i come in and you know we get it done right <laughs> but um yeah i mean there's there is a you know there's a future to it uh you just got to keep your mind open and see what interests you the most but there, there will be something Excellent. Um, I know we're kind of getting close to being done. Um, there is one really good question for all of you guys. Um, what do you guys believe are the most important things college students should focus on? I know we've been giving a lot of really good advice during this whole thing. So maybe try to focus on like your top three, um, like, like things that you think students really need to focus on doing to be successful um, and kind of get a well 
balanced education and be successful in their futures. I have three. Uh, one is we said this getting involved getting involved in clubs for those soft skills Two, and very important is know how to write and technical writing and stuff like that how to speak how to communicate because yes there's there's this mockery and a little bit of like tongue in cheek like hey uh, engineers writing whatever but honestly my boss and a lot of the people that are higher ups in my company the number one skill they make us practice and master is technical writing because we got to make sure that we communicate effectively and that we communicate things clearly right because our reports can be used for in court for example uh that's a very important one know how to write um and the other one is you know Make sure you're doing your school or right your first and foremost a student make sure you go to your classes make sure you ask your questions go to office hours. Um, do all the all those things that uh, are going to help you understanding like Sienna was saying uh, to get those concepts that stick to you, so that you don't kind of forget them a couple of years after um, your your degree, so those are my three cents in there. I'll piggyback on that with the, you know, with communication probably being a big one. Um, it's also just know your audience. Uh, it's a very common thing that I've seen, whether it was, you know, in, in, in classes, um, as well as in industry, not knowing who your presentation or report is going to, um, it, you know, makes it so you kind of prepare it differently. Uh, you know, mentioning, you know, talking to, you know, someone that is not of a technical background, as as you you know as you've seen when I talked about a menu example to explain you know how many different things there can be in an in industry, um, you got to remember those guys in business classes or whatever they'll be in a position that you need to talk to them and they're not going to understand the you know any of the laws of thermodynamics. They're not going to care you know what does you know 200 square meters that means nothing to them. They care about dollars. So you need to be able to explain it to them in a way that is you know a much more elementary level, a little bit higher level. Um, and then just, you know, being able to kind of, you know, get to brass tacks, so to speak, because at the end of the day, you know, this is an industry, it's business, you know, we, we can't make everything perfect. We try very hard, but, you know, um, we, we don't want to, you know, have that hinder making things, you know, overly expensive, uh, using the wrong materials, waiting on, you know, crazy lead time. So, you know, being able to communicate that, though, makes it so you kind of can, I would say, negotiate better, as well as a, as an engineer kind of get slightly more favorable. Um, but I just think it's a very important skill that and, and college is a great way to learn when you still have a bunch of engineering disciplines you'll be talking to that will not understand, um, you know, maybe your mass balances and mass properties, you know, people hear chemistry, they get scared. Uh, Ochem, that's a scary uh, class for most people. Um, you need to be able to explain the stuff that you learned in Ochem to someone who has never opened a chemistry book potentially. Um, just something to kind of think about. And I would say that's a pretty big skill to, to learn that hasn't been added already. Um, I would say a really important skill is time management. Um, if you at work, you're gonna need time management. Um, so you're gonna need to be disciplined. It's kind of like a second skill, I guess. So be disciplined in what you're doing. It might be something I did it might be easier to take jazz in America, but maybe you probably should take a class that's maybe more useful. Um, like one of the things I know you can do is if you do come in, like if you come in having more credits at the end of the year, at the end of your senior year, you might have more opportunities to take more classes that can go towards your four, uh, towards your plus one. So it doesn't take you as long. Or again, I'm in semiconductors. So I know ASU now has a semiconductor certificate that you could take that, you know, usually would cost you $4,000 or whatever. But if you do have that extra space, that's something you're interested in, you can probably take that. Um, there's a lot of other things. So have time management, be disciplined, and then just go out there and have, you know, these are four years, you'll never get back kind of, kind of thing, you know, have fun, um, but definitely uh, make studying and, you, you know, your schoolwork your number one priority. Fabulous. Alrighty, so we are pretty much out of time tonight. Um, but on behalf of Fulton Schools of Engineering, we do want to thank all of our panelists. You guys have been fantastic. Um, and I think our students have learned some really fantastic things as well. So 
we are um, super excited to get to know you guys even a little more personally at the mixer section. Um, so um, for our panelists, um, you guys will now get back to the lobby and then select your own personal sessions and start your own personal Zoom rooms. Um, for our students, the next things are also navigating back to the lobby. Um, and then you will see a list of our mixer guests. Um, some of our panelists will be included. So if you have some additional questions that you want to ask them, you know, write down their name really quick and reach out to them in that mixer. Um, <clears throat> we do have a few areas listed for our mixer guests, um, but of course, feel free to ask them about other areas. These guys are really well versed in their fields, but they have lots of um, other very cool interests as well. Um, and you guys can dip in and out of mixer rooms. Um, so if you have a couple people that you wanna interact with, feel free to jump in and out of those rooms. Um, and students, one new thing for the mixer, please turn on your camera and your microphone. We want these mixers to be much more interactive and much more personal. Um, <clears throat> and like our panelists have said, you know, getting your foot in the door for a lot of these internships and jobs later on is getting to know the right people and making a good impression. So this is a fantastic opportunity to start that. Alrighty. Um, <coughs> as a reminder, this is being recorded. So that'll be in your ASU 101 course um, recording list later on. But I want to say a final thank you to Sandy, Alex, Francisco, and Sienna. Um, and we will see you guys in the mixer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.